This is Tracy Drummond. I am the archivist for the Southern Labor Archives at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And today I have the privilege to be in North Kansas City, Missouri with Bob Bax. Uh, today is uh, August 17th, 2015, and he has kindly agreed to do an oral history interview uh, for the Southern Labor Archives for the Machinist Collections. And we are going to talk about lots of things, but primarily we are going to talk about TWA and your career with TWA. So welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to participate thank in the you. interview. Um, so the question I always start with is this one. Where and when were you born? I was born in Kansas City, Missouri mm -hmm. on November 9th, 1941. 1941. And uh, had your parents always lived here? Did, no. Are they, okay, so where are they from? They're from Missouri also, okay. but in the uh, central part of Missouri, uh, south of Jefferson City, Missouri, which is the capital of Missouri. Okay. Do you know how they met? Uh, they lived in the same town together. Okay. So they just knew each other from... Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you know what brought them to Kansas City? Uh, work. Work? Mm -hmm. What did they do? My dad worked for uh, United Auto Workers. Okay. He worked for General Motors. He was active in the union, and uh, he was very, very strong union man. Mm -hmm. uh, very strong Democrat. Okay. During the time when Lyndon Johnson was president, they took pictures of him because they looked so much alike. Oh he, really? He was in the paper, the Kansas City Star as uh, photos uh, of a look-alike of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Okay, so uh, do you know what kind of cars he worked? Did he ever talk about what kind of cars he worked on? Yes, he, he worked at uh, BOP, they called it. BOP? Uh, Buick, uh -huh. Oldsmobile, and Pontiac in okay. Fairfax, Kansas. Okay. That's just across the river from where we're sitting right now. Okay, so they lived in Kansas City, but um, he worked in Kansas. But he worked in, okay, Fairfax, mm -hmm. Fairfax Kansas. Uh -huh. And do you know why the auto workers brought a big plant to? The plant prior. Or, or, why the, or why the company brought a big plant? Well, prior to it being General Motors, mm -hmm. it was called a bomber plant during World War II, where they built airplanes. Okay. And then after the war, that's when General Motors started to. Who, do you know who built the planes? Uh, I know I don't recall no. who built the planes. But uh, but then the uh, but then General Motors just saw that it was a good way to yeah. reuse mm -hmm. a, an existing space. Mm -hmm. How long was the plant there? How long was it operated by GM? Oh, well they have a new plant there. I would say my dad went to work there. Is ironic in 1941. Okay. Went to work there then because he had no job at the time when I was born, and the plant manager's wife was at the hospital having a baby also, oh. and he got hired at that time. Okay, so two new fathers. Are you the oldest in the family? No, no. I'm number four okay. out of eight. <laughs> oh, a big family. Yes. Okay, but, but two new dads were just sitting in the waiting room together and yes. mm -hmm. started talking, mm -hmm. and, and it was the manager of the plant. Yes. And was the union already in place when your dad started? Yes, yes, okay. it was. 1941, mm -hmm. you said. Um, and had your father been raised in a home where it was strongly encouraged that they join a union, or did he learn about the union once he Well, I, I, he had a little bit of background with it because his dad, was they called him Back Squire because he was good friends with President Truman. A Back a Squire? Squire, that's just what they called him, a Squire. Okay, down okay. Down there in the country, yes. Okay. And uh, he was good friends with President Truman at the time, at the, on the Democratic side and mm -hmm. about unions and stuff. He was uh, from a farming community where my mom and dad grew up at. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. His dad wasn't necessarily involved in politics no. or anything? His dad, his dad was in politics. Oh, his father bit. was? His, okay. Yes, Okay. Correct. Okay. Very democratic. Okay. Mm. So that got passed on. Yes. Um, and so then your dad comes to Kansas City. Yes. Gets a good union job. Mm -hmm. How and, and coming from a farming community, how do you think that, that sort of changed your parents' outlook, especially having such a big family? How, how did that? I think 
the farming, it was pretty uh, slim at that time, mm -hmm. the farming, making wages and stuff. And he come from a big family of 10. And so they just start branching out and moving some of his brothers, moved to St. Louis area. Uh, one moved to New York and uh, they just went on. My other brother went to uh, Oregon, Portland, mm -hmm. and they just branched out and they start working, finding other jobs than the farming lifestyle. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so your dad is here. Did your mom work? No. Outside no, the home? No. Okay, so mm -hmm. she she raised you kids. Yes. So you were the fourth of eight. Yes. And you're from, like on your dad's side, a family of like 10. 10. Ten and ten and on my mom's side, I think there's 10 too on her side. Okay. And mm -hmm. then they they had, because for them it was like, oh, this is just how it is. This, this it is. Uh, a lot, yeah. That's the lifestyle. Did, yeah. all, did um, all of your aunts and uncles also have big families too? Some did, some mm -hmm. didn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't imagine mm -hmm. being from a family that big. So, of the eight of you, Mm -hmm. You were raised pretty much in Kansas City. Did y'all pretty, pretty much, much so. pretty much all except for about five years? Okay. It's a suburb of Kansas, Kansas City. Now it was in on a farm in Peculiar, Missouri. That's just a suburb of Kansas City now. Can you spell that for me? No, I don't. I don't recall exactly. Just like being peculiar. Oh, peculiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's a great name for a little mm -hmm. town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've never heard that before. That's yeah. really, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so they lived there a few years. For five years. For five moved, years. Moved back to Kansas City in 1951. Okay. Then from then on, it was always Kansas City. Okay. Same and location. what was it like growing up in Kansas City? Because you, you said you were born in... <clears throat> yeah, I was born in Kansas City. In 41. 41, in about 45... 46 we moved it was a little farm 80 mm -hmm. acre farm mm -hmm. my dad still worked for general motors drove back and forth he farmed and worked at general motors did both just a small 80 acre farm right and uh that's yeah. a lot that's still i mean that's not nothing that's still a lot of work yes oh, it was but i imagine as your kids were coming up you learned how to oh yes you, you all had your <laughs> you all had your jobs assigned had our own you. chores to do every day yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um, and then after five years of that, and we moved back, back to the city. Back to the city, and so at that point you would have been about nine or ten. Yeah, I was in the fourth grade when we moved back. Mm -hmm. So, so then from the fourth grade on, what was it like in Kansas City then? What was the city like? What was uh, oh, is or city, what was your neighborhood like? A blue collar neighborhood. Okay. Really, blue collar, nice neighborhood. Really mm -hmm. nice. People worked for Armco Steel or Sheffield Steel. Mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. or uh, they worked for the railroad we lived, we lived awful close for the where the railroad was i would say most of the communities it was anywhere 70 percent unionized the mm -hmm. people it was at that time and um is kansas city in general a pro-union kind of yes yes city even now i wouldn't say uh, no not like it used to be but okay. i wouldn't say I don't even know if 50 50 anymore mm -hmm. because it's just the way union jobs and things have deteriorated so much mm -hmm. in the United States. I think it's down to close to 11 percent, I think, is only unionized mm -hmm. people now mm -hmm. for okay. what it used to be. But at one time you said about, you said 70? Oh, in, in, in my neighborhood. Yeah. In my neighborhood. Oh, it's specific. Okay. Very yes. good, very mm -hmm. good designation mm -hmm. to make. Um, and was it the kind of neighborhood where you could just come home after school and... Never had a key to the house. Really? No. If doors were unlocked? Uh, yes. People it's... on the front porches, yes. And was it mostly a white neighborhood? But yes. you said, and, and you said um, Bax mm -hmm. is a German name. Mm -hmm. So were there a lot of people of German descent uh, here all, or... Uh, very, very diverse. Really? And it would be maybe Belgium. Okay. Uh, maybe some Polacks. There was Pol Polish people. Okay. Uh, Irish people. Okay. German. They were very diversified. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm. But no uh, African Americans. No. no not, Asians. Not, a, not, not at that time. No. Not at that time. Okay. No. Okay. Um, so you're growing up in this great idyllic neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Pro union. Mm -hmm. Pro union neighborhood. Oh yes. 
What were the things you enjoyed in school? Oh my gosh. I would say I was played a lot of athletics. Really? Yes. So I, you I were played ball, all three sports. Football, did, baseball, basketball. Yes. Okay. The Letterman, all four sports. Really? Yes. Yes. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what was, you know, especially coming from a big, such a, you know, big family, eight of you, as, mm -hmm. as you were being raised, of course, mm -hmm. um, what was expected? Were y'all expected to join the military? Were y'all expected to go to college? Like, what were the expectations? I, 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 been, I started in the fourth grade when we moved to the city. Mm -hmm. My first job was in the city. I said, I threw the paper for the Kansas City Star. I started, my mom got us up at four o'clock in the morning in the fourth grade. We strapped a paper bag over our shoulder. That's the way it used to be thrown. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to History Channel mm -hmm. now. And we threw paper. We had a route. We threw our papers. We get done probably. 6 15 6 30 get ready and go to school after school that time this i wasn't that much involved in sports yet and then we would, would throw the evening paper we had the morning paper mm -hmm. uh, the kansas city times and they call it and in the evening was kansas city star we threw both of it and then about how many houses did you deliver we, to it was about 80 houses i think around my oh no i is a hundred and i remember about 114 houses i think we, we threw how big of a Oh, area right. was that? Oh, several blocks. There was two of us. One one brother would throw on one side, and I'd throw on the other side. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'd take us a little over an hour and a half, maybe, or something to throw that many. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, but from an early age, you were expected to... Oh, yes. Oh, work. And you didn't think no different. Did you know, mm -hmm. Mom and Dad needed the money. You so know, so you were you were actually working to help with the household? Oh, absolutely. We, okay. didn't, we didn't take the money ourselves. We okay. gave it to Mom and Dad. Okay. And so you're the... So was this one of your older brothers? Uh huh. And so if you were in the fourth grade, mm -hmm. you probably had siblings going on up into middle school, high school at that yeah. point. And did they have oldest, jobs too? Yeah. Oh yes, they had jobs. Oh, they all did. Yes. Okay. They had one worked at a grocery store or something like. That. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just a very industrious family. Yes. I mm -hmm. bet you don't know what it's like to not work. No. <laughs> I'm still doing it. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Of course you are. Oh, that's <clears> great. So. You're doing the papers in high school. You get a mm -hmm. little more involved in athletics. Mm -hmm. What then? Uh, okay, when I, when I was playing athletics in, in, in high school, that's when I really got involved. Baseball, basketball, football, mm -hmm. track. And then in the evenings or weekends, I would work at the grocery store. Okay. Started out as a sacker. <clears throat> then I worked the produce and stock and shelves and after that. Mm -hmm. Then after that, graduated from high school. It's kind of funny, I, 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 ironic about it, the whole story. I was uh, home for two days, and my dad one morning said, have you got a job yet, son? My mom packed me a lunch. Uh -huh. Me and another friend of mine went to high school together, uh, went down to the railroad tracks, and went, come to a grain elevator, come to this one, they hired us. Okay. I worked there five years to the day. Really? Every day without missing a day's work. Really? Scooping grain. A grain elevator. Uh, that's where you see these big silos. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of them being tore down now. Mm -hmm. Where they stored grain, they used to mix the grain and set, ship it out. And, okay. Yeah. Now, was that mm -hmm. job a union job? Or yes. It was a union job. Mm -hmm. Which union was that? That was the Grain Millers Union. The Grain Millers Union. Grain. Grain Millers Union. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think... Um, I'm a... It's not often that I guess more agricultural uh -huh. agricultural work is organized. Right. So, mm -hmm. Green Millers mm -hmm. Union. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and you did that for five years to the day. Uh -huh. And at that point, had you met uh, or dated anyone, or were you? Well, my wife. We went to high school together, and, and we never dated in high school. Okay. I, I'm too busy playing ball. Okay. <laughs> Afterwards, and then in 1961, I got married. In okay. November 61. Okay. And I was working. And what year did you graduate high school? 1959. 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. So two years after high school. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm working, and then uh, my wife's uncles said, "Why don't you try something different?" I worked for Sweet Lumber Company there for about a month. R.L. Sweet Lumber Company. 
there was a carpenter's union. I never get involved because I was only there a month. Then right after that, I went to work at TWA. Why were you only there a month? Because TWA called me. They called you? Yeah, I put in an application. Okay. So you thought working on a, a plane yes. would be more... Oh, yes. And more then the benefits and everything, much better. Much better? How did they sell that? Can I ask you? Like, what kind of... Like, when you saw the advertisement for the jobs at TWA, the, was, was it on the radio? Was it in the paper? It was in the... I would say... My uncle knew about it. Okay. That there, there was iron. He, he told me about it. Okay. So I went down on a Friday to fill out an application. I, I would do anything. I started out as a fleet service person cleaning the airplanes. Okay. I was filling out an aptitude test, and a guy tapped me on the shoulder. I didn't even get a third of the way through it. Mm -hmm. He says, come up with me. Went in the back room. He says, when do you want to go to work? I got kind of strange. When I want to go to work, I said, right now. Mm -hmm. He says, can you come to work Monday? I says, yes. I was kind of strange. I said, I didn't fill out the application or anything yet. Mm -hmm. He says, Bob, I remember you playing ball at school. I remember you. So you got hired on your popularity and being a good uh, athlete. I guess. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he says, can you come to work? I said, I come to work Monday. And when, that's when I started out. Okay, and then you had to tell the, the folks at the... Lumber yard that you yes yes they knew before I even hired on I had an application at okay. TWA okay. yes okay. they okay. knew mm -hmm. so um, and you were picked because somebody remembered you mm -hmm. it's some sometimes it's who you know yeah so that's, that's right it's, it's good it's, it's good to be connected yes and um, I didn't even know the gentleman at all none really mm -mm. okay so. And, and you said what appealed to you was just better benefits and everything. Oh, it wasn't yes. so much this idea of aviation and aerospace. And oh, I was. I, I had that in my mind about aerospace, but I didn't. I didn't know how I would really qualify to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like in another world to me, mm -hmm. from it, mm -hmm. being on the railroad where the grain elevator was. And, yeah. You know, I, I drove the engine a little bit on the on the railroad a little bit. Okay. Did that and switchman and did stuff like that. And, and I got there and I started washing airplanes and cleaning them. And I says, well, I don't want to do this all my life either. Yeah. So I'm working in the airplane one day and come and the supervisor come up to me and says, uh, how would you like to be a mechanic? I said, I sure would. He says, well, you go in there, you got a test in the office you got to take. I come back out of the office for even look at my test. My name's already posted on the bulletin board. I'm a mechanic. <laughs> Wow. Well, it was uh, just um, easy for you. And then, yes, and just, uh, I guess the work ethics mm -hmm. I had, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd always uh, be on a job, always mm -hmm. work, never late for work. Right. I worked there 46 years, never late for work. Never. That wasn't in my vocabulary. Snow day, go to work at 6.30 in the morning, I'd leave at 3.30, make sure I wasn't late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being a mechanic, one, I said, well... I ought to get my license at AMP mechanic, so I went to school to get my AMP license. Okay. So and I, and that's what, aircraft and power plant license. And was there, was there a local, I guess, vocational school that offered? Yeah, right down, right down here at the where we're going to the archives, TWA, the okay. museum, okay. It's right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, was that established here specifically? Once TWA no, was established here, no, it was, here? Just, it was it's, it's separately. Okay. Separate operation. Okay. I decided to go there. And okay. Now, had you already joined the union when you started? Was were the machinists already representing? Oh yes. When I started, I joined the union as soon as I hired on. Was it an open shop or a closed shop? It's closed shop. So everybody had. Oh to be yeah, the everybody. Union. Had to okay, be. okay. Yes. And so you started out. It's fleet service, and I fleet worked, service cleaning. I worked at starting sixty four, sixty six. I was a mechanic. Okay. So I did about so, I did about a year and a half. Okay. Working. And how long and, was school? How long did you? Um. Well, I, when when I was cleaning there, I started school, then started doing that, and just progressed up. Okay, so you were in school even before you got the mechanic position. Oh no 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 okay. no! I started then and just grasped things pretty quick as okay. a mechanic okay. field because I always tinkered on things and always before I even started okay. that. Okay. So I got in that, and then in 1966, I got drafted. 
I was already a mechanic. Mm -hmm. I got went to the service, uh, got drafted into the army, mm -hmm. and uh, in the army I um, went through basic training. Where were you? Where did you go through basic training? At Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. And I get out of uh, basic training, and I have no orders to go anywhere. Everybody's gone, but Robert Bax, he's the only one left around in the whole barracks. And they finally, a week later, they come, they said, you're going to leadership school. I said, no, why don't you just send me down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, because I know I'm going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They say, son, we tell you what to do. You don't tell us. I said, yes, sir. Right. I went back. I said, you're going to leadership. I went to leadership school. Where was that? Down at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. I went to and Leonard. it's Fort Leonard? Fort Leonard Wood. That's Leonard Wood, okay. That's the biggest basic training camp the Army has. Okay. Is it still active today? Yes. Okay. Very active. Mm -hmm. And so I go to leadership school and everybody's getting ready to graduate to go out and they pull me to the side and they says, uh, Bax, you're the honored graduate of the class. I said, okay, big deal. <laughs> I know where I'm going. Did they tell you why they picked you for leadership school and didn't send you straight? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I come out of the highest grades of, of the whole class. Okay. In, in everything, marching, you know, giving commands and all that stuff where you go to leadership school and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. And so, and then leadership school was preparing you for potentially a career yeah. in the Army. Yes. But definitely yeah. a role as a higher ranking yes. officer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I went to there. I get out of there and then I don't have no orders for just a couple of days or something. They said, you're going to AIT. That's Advanced Infantry. Infantry training right there, Fort Leonard Wood again. There's no cattery there. That means no E6 sergeants, E7s, and I'm to take care of the troops. I come out of uh, leadership school as an acting E6 stripes on my. Mm -hmm. So I come out of there, and only thing I do, I'm in charge of the company, Reverly in the morning, and all that stuff. And here I'm just a young recruit myself. They said you can handle it. So I go through that eight weeks, nine weeks of that training. I get finished that training, I have no orders again. I said, what am I doing that? They said, they said, you're going to drill sergeant school now. So you kept seeing all the people you were going through these programs with and graduating with, mm -hmm. I would imagine most of them being sent to Vietnam at that point. Oh yes, oh they did. That must have been terrible because you never knew no, I wound up in Vietnam though too. You did you yes. eventually, okay. Yeah. And and so, but then the guys I was training, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I I seen over there, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so so, and and you were just telling me that it was that you finished uh -huh. that training uh -huh. once again. No orders right no, away. No orders again. Then they say you're going to drill sergeant school. Okay, drill sergeant school. Mm -hmm. And that was at the same place? Same place. Okay. I graduated from drill sergeant school, and then they sent me to a basic training company. Mm -hmm. So I trained troops. I used to give the bayonet training up to maybe 500 troops at a time. You were still using up. bayonets in the 60s? Oh, yeah. You put bayonets on the end of your weapons, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. I give the classes to the whole uh, brigade. Everyone to come through, I give classes to. What year are we in by now? We're in 1967. Okay, so that's uh, mm -hmm. three years? No, that's just a little over a year. A little over I was a year. A, I was a hard East 5 sergeant within 11 months. Okay. And that's not even heard of. Okay, probably. right, right. Mm. And then so I had a couple cycles of troops come through, and then all of a sudden, I get orders, you gotta go to Vietnam. So I wind up in Vietnam, come back after that tour, I come back, get discharged, go back to work at TWA. So let's go back and talk about Vietnam. So mm -hmm. when you were mm -hmm. drafted and you went over, mm -hmm. you eventually ended up there. Mm -hmm. Were you, what did you go in with an officer's rank? And no, I was an NCO, non commissioned officer. Okay. And NCOs are one where stripes, officers wear bars and stuff on their okay. collars. Okay. No, I was, a, I was an NCO. Okay. And what did you do there? What were you I was in, in charge? I was in the 4th Division, 299th Engineers over there. Okay. So you helped. We build roads and stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, 
So were you pretty much, how long was your tour? A tour in Vietnam but for one year. One year. Mm-hmm. And while you were there, did you did you see any part of the war? Oh, yes. You I did? seen part of the war. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then I that come must have back. been very difficult. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. But you people, were... When people always say, let's go to war, let's do this. I said, you ever been to a war? And that shuts them up. They don't say mm-hmm. no more. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. No. But then I come back to TWA again and uh, a mechanic when I come back when you come back from the military you have they put you in the same pay pay grade job you had when you left Mm -hmm. so mine was a mechanic Mm -hmm. so uh, I come back they had openings in different shops and they had one where they called a carpenter shop they built a lot of things I'll get into that for the aircraft but this there uh General Foreman says, Bob, we want you in here. I said, okay. So I went to the carpenter shop. We, the carpenter shop, a lot of said, what the heck does carpenters do in, on the aircraft? You know, they ain't no carpenter work on the aircraft. Well, on the aircraft, when they make different parts, you got to make molds mm. for the different parts. And they had to even molds that beat it around the wood and stuff. You'd make the mold for them so they fit the part. <clears throat> and they had a plastic shop in there too. All the trim you'd see on the chairs and the aircraft and the, the trays you pull down, the cockpit, all that was made in our shop. Because we'd make, make the mold for it mm-hmm. and then the plastic would mold over the top of that and then we'd trim it all out and make it, made it all, almost, I can't say almost, I'd say maybe 40% of the uh, interior of the aircraft we'd made in there. Okay. That what percentage of the entire plane was made there? Uh, this was, these parts of the planes were made, when they come into overhaul, mm. the parts were made there to replace the parts on the aircraft. Okay. That's what we did. Okay. okay. We wouldn't actually make them for the aircraft. The ca- when the aircraft came in, it was all equipped that way. We just did the repair parts. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then I got involved with Stuart there, you know, in the shop, and then from the Stuart guy. Went then to the, I worked in the safety committee for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself just telling you what I did. Well, yeah, maybe a little. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but shortly after you came back from Vietnam, mm-hmm. you came back as a mechanic, same mm-hmm. pay grade, mm-hmm. became a steward. Mm-hmm. I was why a was steward it, in a shop. Why mm-hmm. was it important for you to actually not only be a member of the union, but to get involved? Probably the history of my dad, mm-hmm. you know, some of the stuff he went through as a union stuff, you know, mm-hmm. getting involved. I could just see uh, maybe the leadership part of it, you know, someone to take charge, you know. What you had been specifically trained to do? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in the military. So, so, yeah. so a lot of your military training oh, yes. really helped mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, being in front of people and doing things and, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, that just... I, I didn't have no problem doing it, you know, the grievance procedure and stuff like that as a steward, you know, mm-hmm. I did that. And uh, then I went uh, in the safety committee. I got elected to be on the, in the, on the safety committee at TWA, I worked in there. And uh, then uh, I worked in there, for, I don't know how many years I did that, you recall. And then, uh, I was elected to become general chairman of the district down here. Okay, that is jumping too far ahead, so let's back <laughs> okay. up a little. Um, how many folks were in the shop? In my shop, I probably had maybe around 30-some people in there. But in, and in the whole? Then in the whole shop was probably 30-some people in there. Okay, but I mean, um, how many machinists were worked at TWA total? Oh, but up at the overhaul base at one time, we had close to 5,000 membership. So there were close to 5,000 of the oh, overhaul oh, oh, base. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's a, okay. Okay. So um, it, that's it was everybody. That's, that's included the cleaners and mechanics mm-hmm. and, uh, and all that, the ramp people and all that. It's probably 5,000. And that's a lot of folks in the community, too, right? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I heard this great story once. It was uh, some folks who worked at a at an aerospace company in California, 
And at one point, the company started giving them some trouble, of, you know, the, the union some trouble about the contract or something, mm-hmm. and so that the city understood how important those mm-hmm. people being in a union were to mm-hmm. them. They all, I think they said they all took out, like, silver dollars, mm-hmm. and they paid for stuff like mm-hmm. that. All the union members paid mm-hmm. for stuff like that mm-hmm. over a couple of weeks so they mm-hmm. could see just how much. Mm-hmm. I mean, do did, did you think that the... There was the same sort of similar or a similar impact in Kansas City of how many, because they had good jobs, they had oh, good union jobs, oh, yes. that they were really um, part of oh, yes. keeping the local economy active. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the unions, uh, the the brotherhood of, of the membership, TWA or something like that, we had an Eastern Airlines strike and, and Bob Haynes. Uh, what year? Oh, uh, the Eastern strike I started it had to be in the late... 80s, I would say. Oh, so it was the strike. Yeah, it was okay, strike. 89. Yeah, some yeah, yeah somewhere in there. Yeah. Yes, and would take up a collection every paycheck to give to the people here in the Kansas City area, so they had food on the mm-hmm. table, you know. Mm-hmm. And everybody did it. Oh, just very, very tremendous. They would give. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't uh, uh, Bob Haynes. When you get him here, he'll really tell you about it. He was in charge of it then. And it, it was good. And then we had, the first strike I was ever on was in uh, 1966. They call it the, probably the great strike. Five airlines at once went out. Then the government didn't allow that no more. Okay. Mm-hmm. 1966. Six. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing a big booklet at the Grand Lodge, and we actually have it at the archives now. Uh-huh. But it's all mm-hmm. of the press. Uh-huh. And correspondence, and news clippings, and mm-hmm. and um, PR announcements mm-hmm. about the strike. Uh-huh. So it had a huge impact. Uh, oh, it did. And so, and were they all organized with the machinists, or was it all different unions? I would say, basically, it was machinist union. Basically, that was had because we had Eastern, we had TWA, we had United. There was three of them. There was. Trying to think of the other two who was on strike with his, was it? Gosh, I can't even call it. Come out of uh, Miami, I think the other carrier was. Um, the other, I think, I think it might have been uh, Pan Am was the other one on strike too. I think. Okay. And. They wasn't with the machine as Pan Am was. I, I don't know. I don't know what union they was. I don't know if it was a uh, transport workers union. I don't recall. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. But the five major carriers were right at that time. How did that impact the? Uh, us uh, ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were very fortunate at that time. Uh, there was a lot of work in the Kansas City area. Mm-hmm. wasn't wasn't hard to find a job on the side when you went to Morgan. Okay. The picket line. You you could find something. You could didn't didn't lose a beat. How's okay. that? Okay, okay, okay. And how long was that strike? This strike was oh gosh, six weeks maybe. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's all not through the summer. Um, yeah. All through the summer. Yes. So, um, did y'all have a, a good strike fund in place? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because I was. Um, it didn't pay much for strike funding. Pretty right. much, you you made it. On your own, on the outside. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to work, you could work. Okay, okay. Um, but it still must be frightening to be on a strike because you don't know how long it'll last. Well, uh, for a lot of people, yes. You know, we had other strikes. You know, and some people really got intimidated by companies. You know, if you don't come back to work, and this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Uh, uh, they really talk to them people. You know, don't cross the picket line. You know, keep them out. Uh, uh, there wasn't many, but a few, you know, they were scared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Everybody's back to work after six weeks. Yes. Mm-hmm. So overall then, this is worth asking, what kind of relationship did um, TWA have with the machinists at the time? Well, I would say there have been bumps in the road, mm-hmm. but I, basically a lot of the supervision and everything come up through the ranks through the union. Really? Yes. And then they went over. Yeah. To, and then went over to management. Yeah, they went to management. Yes, mm-hmm. they they knew what it was like. Mm-hmm. Some of them, you know, 
take on a different hat, you know, and really think they're better than you are, mm -hmm. which uh, they're not. We knew they weren't. Right. And right. so we, we made it all right. Mm -hmm. We had some really good ones, and we had a few not so good. Okay. Um, what did you enjoy most about your work in the machine shop? Oh, it's just the camaraderie of, of, the, of the membership and what you accomplish and what you get mm -hmm. done at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're doing something that's uh, it's going to make an airplane work and you feel comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. You feel good it's going to work, it's going to fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people used to tell me, he says, guy starting the planes late or something. I said, I always used to tell them, there's no filling stations in the sky. You better be right now. Mm -hmm. And they understood mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so was, and, and you said mach machine shop and carpenter shop, but was that the last? The carpenter shop was the last one I, shop I worked. I worked in the aircraft before I went to the carpenter shop. Right. I didn't say that earlier, but I worked on, on out in the hangar before I went to Okay, so assembly. Yes. Okay. That's where I, when I come back out of the service, they give me a job that pays the same, mm -hmm. you know, and they had openings there and the, and the uh, uh, shop foreman uh, asked me if I would come in there. It was days and weekends off. And I, I said, yeah, I'll start running that right away. That didn't last but a couple of weeks. I went to night, so, but that's okay. <laughs> um. And all the while you're sort of getting different positions in the union. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how long were you in the carpenter shop before you, I guess, were full time? Was full were full time? Steward, union steward. Not a steward, but like when you left the shop, did you ever leave the shop to be a full time officer? Or uh, yeah. you, oh, or, oh yes. Or did you retire in the shop? No, no, I retired. Right. And come, come to the district here. I worked. Okay. There. I worked as an organizer first before I become a general chairman. And what year was that? What that was probably ninety one. I started organizing. Ninety one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were you were in the shop then for twenty five. Oh yeah, probably. Or so years. Mm -hmm. As a union steward and stuff, and and as a safety committee there at the mm -hmm. overhaul base before I left full time. I left probably in ninety one. It wasn't full time, but I was off the clock probably uh, 99% of the time I was working for the union. And what was the work of the safety committee? Uh, and were they well, created in response to specific issues? It, 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 oh, shop? yeah. It was all over the plant. All over the, the, the entire, hand. okay. Yes. And was it with Safeties, baggage handlers and, and everybody? Everybody, okay. yes. Everybody. So it everybody. crossed all jobs. Yeah, all jobs. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm, sure did. Okay. Make sure that they had the safety equipment on. You know they were properly the machine had the, uh, the safety equipment guards on them and stuff like that, so people wouldn't get hurt. And was it s concurrent with sort of the creation of OSHA? Oh yeah. And, and oh, making yes. and making mm -hmm. people more aware of the sure. importance of safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how mm -hmm. did them? How did management respond to that? Because I'm. At first, they was. Uh, I would say probably negative to it because it. Slowed them down a little bit, made them think, you know, mm -hmm. think twice. But they got used to it though. Okay. Because the whole industrial got that way, and then it had to be that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And did your work in the carpenter shop change over the years? Is well, it changed. Yes, it did. That's when the plastic, like I said earlier, that's when the plastic department come in. We start making plastic part. The reason the plastic come to the carpenter shop, we made all the molds, mm -hmm. and the molds were made there. And then the machine, we had big machines and stuff, and they heated up the plastic. You come down and form over the molds, and then fans and stuff would come on, cool it, and mm -hmm. parts. You probably seen it on TV, probably on some shows how that's done. You know, they inject it and. Okay comes out okay. and then the guys the guys were really really uh, uh, talented people in there and when I, had, when I was in the carpenter shop for a while I become the, what they call crew chief I was the lead of the, okay. of the guys in there okay. so um, <clears throat> during all that time your time in the shop um, did you were there ever any um, contract negotiations that were 
maybe it didn't go so well or might not have gone so well? Were there ever any times when you were worried that the contract might not come through? Because you said there was a strike in 66. Yeah. But after that, for a long time... Yeah, we, was, we had was, different strikes. I don't recall the dates on it. We had... But uh, a mechanic, when when they negotiated contract for the machine, mechanic was a mechanic. That's the wages and benefits they got. And if you was a, a cleaner or a stores uh, person or a ramp guy, it was all ne- negotiated by the machine union. All of that was included in the contract. So it was one contract covered for everybody. Okay. Yes, correct. And just different wage scales. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. But then in 90, you said 91, mm-hmm. was when you came on full-time here as an organizer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, how did your life change once you were off the shop floor with a regular schedule, pretty much? Uh-huh. That coming, because I know that or, organizing work is the, some of the hardest work oh, yes. by union. So got what, a lot, got so a lot what, of training from... Uh, uh, Placid Harbor, Wimper Center, same. Mm-hmm. Went to, went to uh, Bob Haynes. We were just talking all ago. They thought I was a full time student there for a while, <laughs> taking up different classes and all uh-huh. that. Uh, but it was it was very good. You learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned from early early on. Uh, the best thing you do is listen, listen, listen. Mm-hmm. And that little thing that you think just a little grievance or something, little complaint is monumental to the person explaining to it. Mm-hmm. You keep listening and listening to them and finally it comes down they're thinking, well, maybe this isn't so bad. You know, they almost talked their self in back to reality where they thought it was really bad mm-hmm. and find out what a violation is or, or something like that. So it, it, it's really good. Okay. And you took organizing classes there. Oh, yeah. Took hey, do you remember who taught those classes? Oh my gosh, I not I don't recall up there who who are the ones that most of them. I talked to Chris Wagner. I remember when he come to work up there to Placid Harbor. Oh really? <laughs> and he's a he's a ahead of it now. Mm-hmm. Well, and if you were, how long were you an organizer? How long was it? Oh my gosh, I don't know how many years I did that. Often I did other things. You know, when whenever. The international call or want something done somewhere, yeah. I usually got the call. So you were sent, I mean, you were in at District Lodge 142, but you might be sent. Yeah, oh yeah, all, all, all over. Well, it, it composed of one District 142, right? but it might be somewhere placed in 141. Okay. I would go in that district or where, wherever representation was by the IEM of that. Okay. We would go a lot of times. You know, a lot of times you, you'd have raids on your union. Somebody want to raid the mechanic union and we get sitting there. Or I worked with uh, Sherry Cooper. She was, remembers how many, how long I was down in St. Louis working when the, when the flight attendants come into the IEM. Mm-hmm. I was one of the ones down there organizing on that mm-hmm. for, okay. for a long time, yes. Okay. So, um, but were you largely working with people working at airlines. Oh, yes. So that yeah, was the organizing. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah 98% of the time, yes. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Did you find that work rewarding? Oh, yes, absolutely. And it, it was a lot of times, you know, it was like, uh, they want to come to you like a complaint department. They always mm-hmm. have something to, to gripe about. You mean the local? Uh, no, the membership. Okay. You know, when you're out there organizing, okay. you know, the, you know, uh, we're visible to them. Right. You get the company, they're not. You talk to somebody up, but they can see us. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so they come and and uh, sit down there and, and talk to them and try to rationale with them. And and so much of it, they had legitimate gripes and stuff, and want to know how to, how it gets fixed in the union, and what kind of process they have, and and you just explain it to them and and. and when you see people catch it on to it, that that's rewarding, you know, because they're not familiar with it whatsoever, how it works. Mm-hmm. A lot of people come to work every day, every day, pay their union dues, go back home, never have a complaint. They just pay their dues, and they're, they're the ones that realize they pay the dues for the benefits they have. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the company's just not going to give them them benefits. Right. right. And they realize that. I would say most of the people are like that. 
in mm-hmm. the inner union. Well, in general, how were how were um, meetings? You were out of local sixteen fifty. Yes, start reading. Okay. Yes, so that I would was. Be, so you're local sixteen fifty, well. uh-huh. and and. Um, and uh, so, how many? What was a, a union meeting like? Did you, did you, did was it a pretty full house? Oh, was it, a good it all depends. When it comes around contract time, it really yeah. gets full. Okay. okay. It really gets full around then. When it, when you're talking about money in your pocket or something, you know, and uh, that's when really. Otherwise, you would have. Uh, it was a very big local here. You would have, oh, I would say, any given meeting would have over hundred people, and okay. even even when it wasn't controversial mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, mm. okay. so um do you uh, said so then back to your time as an organizer do you remember the most difficult organizing campaign you ever worked on probably the continental ramp people i and, worked on it and what we city worked for that? years in houston i worked all, almost every station the continental flew in i was Okay. Always going over, all over. Okay. You name it, I, I'm by, I was probably there. Okay. So this <laughs> and uh, because the company would always throw a carrot at them when they get ready, you know, have a vote for a union or something, and uh, uh, it would get where they would try to tell how bad the union was and how what was going to happen to them. And, and then right after we would not have enough cards or something, we'd have a vote on it. And we come awful close several times. And uh, it was di- very discouraging then, you know, you think, oh man, we got it this time. A lot of people would say they'd vote for you. The company would tell them to tell, sign a card, and tell them you're gonna vote for the union. Then when it comes time, don't do it, you know. Mm-hmm. That's just what some of the company tactics are. And uh, when we come so close so many times and it didn't work and it would get discouraging, there's no doubt, on that campaign there. And one of the rewarding ones then was TWA flight attendants, you know, mm-hmm. worked on that, you know. And, and would uh, go back to Continental a little, just a little bit, they finally become IAM members when they emerged with their, or when United bought Continental out. Okay. They call it an acquisition or a merger or whatever they want, but... Uh, uh, now they are IAM members now. Okay. Um, so how long have you been organized there? God, I'm trying to think how many years, six, maybe years or so. I don't know, somewhere in that way. Somewhere, maybe seven. I don't know exactly because I, I, did, I did a little bit of everything in between. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, so what did you do after? after Organize? Organizing, yeah. Uh, become a general chairman. For District 142. And what duties did that, does that involve? Well, a general chairman, he, he is one responsible for the contract at, uh, uh, you was assigned different stations. Mm-hmm. You made the contract in my, I started out contract at the overhaul base here in, in Kansas City. I had the membership here in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. I had Southwest Airlines. I was I had a big deal with Southwest Air on the, uh, uh, reservation agents and, and the ticket counter people I represented them I had like uh, I had Tulsa Oklahoma and I had Albuquerque New Mexico I had Denver I had uh, down in St. Louis I went to St. Louis and I don't know they scattered you out all over <laughs> pretty thin mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. Arkansas I had a little rock Arkansas uh, but that's what you did you make the uh, uh, as uh, Arbitration. I was the one that uh, uh, set up all the arbitration ca- cases for the whole district. Uh, you know, uh, when in that case, I'd contact the arbitrators, get the dates and with the companies and assignment, and I would set in as a board member on the arbitration cases. Okay. So, lots of stuff. Yeah, lots of stuff. Lot, yeah, yeah. Lot, I, lots of, and you're kind of in charge and. Mm-hmm. The right. person they look to to mm-hmm. make sure they're doing yeah, everything uh, right. Yeah, when it comes to our, there after a while, I was that. I still had a lot of stations, but I had I was assigned to all the arbitration cases here in the district. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you find that work rewarding? Oh yes, very much so. Yeah, okay. very much so. Yes, yes. Did y'all? I got to know a lot of arbitrators and all that stuff. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. <clears throat> who to pick? Who not to pick? Right. <laughs> and did you retire as general chairman? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. 
And so, and what year did you retire? I bet in, you... in July of 2009. July of 2009. Mm-hmm. So you did that for a little over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it was mentioned earlier that with Flight 800 mm-hmm. that you were sent. Mm-hmm. You're just the level of experience that you yes. have. Mm-hmm. I guess based on your time in the mm-hmm. machine was, and carpenter, carpentry shop. Yes, I was in there and I, I belonged to the, um, at TWA, they call it a, a trauma team. The trauma team. Okay. I belonged to that also. Okay. And I had a family, a husband and wife, they were dentists that got killed on that flight. And I was up You there. were assigned to that family? Yes. And so how, how big was the trauma team? So was the trauma team organized by TWA to also include members of the union? Union. Yes. Like like anyone that worked for them. Yes. And mm-hmm. they could go in mm-hmm. and had a, a level of expertise in mm-hmm. some area. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you were assigned to a particular family. Mm-hmm. Um, was that the, that probably was not the first airplane related disaster that had happened while you worked for TWA. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. When I was assigned to the drama team. Trauma team. Right. Yeah, was well, the well that was the first one you were assigned to, but I mean, I guess like over the years there have been other things that oh, happened. Oh, there have been other things. maybe yeah. that you weren't, you weren't. Yeah, I wasn't involved in so, um, who So who all was on this team that was put together? Was it people at the company and... And, and, and union people that were okay. uh, both assigned to... They asked me if I would be on it. Mm-hmm. They approached me. And you did know, they years before even this flight eight hundred? I was on it for years. Oh, so so it was already like a pre-existing oh, yes. committee. Yes. It was yes. okay. Mm-hmm. How did they prepare you for something like that? Because I imagine you have never. Well, mm-hmm. you were in mm-hmm. Vietnam. You might have seen something mm-hmm. similar, but not yeah. the same. Well, I don't know. I I guess they just picked the individual people they thought could handle a job, I guess, you know, they asked right. me if I would participate in that. Mm-hmm. I said, sure. Mm-hmm. And do they give you... They get a little s- bit of basic training about it, yes. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. And different scenarios of yeah, things that might yeah. happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, so much of it was basically common sense, you know, you know, mm-hmm. you don't know, you don't know what you're going to get into until you get there. Right. I had probably, well, not probably, I did have the biggest family of the whole scenario that happened on Flight 800. Okay. You had Mary Giuliani up there at the family, you name it. I was next, just as close there with President Clinton. Mm-hmm. There with the family, the family I had. It was so mm-hmm. huge. They had family members come from all over, all over the world. Or probably had wound up probably 170 members come for that funeral service for the two dentists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what was it like that first day going in? I mean, what did when they called you and said, "Well, something's happened." Yes, I was. Out. I was in the car by coming home from. Uh, I know exactly where I was in front of the Royal Stadium, baseball stadium, just passing it. I got the call. It says mm-hmm. Bob, you catch the first flight to New York. There's been an accident, so don't worry, but you just get to the airport. Mm-hmm. And I said okay, and get to the airport, and then they, like Bob Haynes was with me. We met, got the first flight to New York and got, got up there and uh, they asked different people, uh, different friends didn't want to know what your religion you was and all this stuff. And I said, I'm Catholic, and Roman Catholic. The family ahead of me was Roman Catholic too, but Haynes, Haynes took the first one and then they asked him, the brother, I said, all right. So I just happened to get this family where husband and wife got killed on it. And they just happened to be the ones that had the big family. Mm-hmm. They kind of made a joke about it afterwards. They <laughs> did all what I had up there, but it was okay. It okay. come out. And so what was your day-to-day work like being assigned oh, to the assign, people? Oh, that, to get the people together and, you know, let bring them updates, you know, on the recovery effort of, of if they found their membership and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And uh, just... Uh, well, they want to know what happened, what brought the airplane down, all that, and all that stuff we didn't know yet. Had good idea, I still have it to myself, that uh, me and Sherry Cooper, a lot of members, we keep to herself, and we sign papers not to even talk about it. You know, we can't talk about it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's that's the way that thing mm-hmm. went. And it just, uh, 
get the hotel rooms for the people, get them flight ticket information to get them flown to New York for the service, mm -hmm. and uh, just keep them updated. Anything they needed, we had to get it for them, and and uh, till the time come and the individual that I had, uh, the body was viewed when only bodies were viewed under that. But he come up uh, fully clothed and everything out of it. There was a lot of different scenarios about that 800 flight. So from the time of the accident until mm -hmm. you were free to come home again, mm -hmm. how long were you working on that? I was up there close to three weeks probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I guess they were had people diving to bring oh, things yes. up. Mm -hmm. So were you looking at the I guess the wreckage and things like that. No, I didn't look at no wreckage. No. No, you no. were just you were really just, there to just, service just, as a the family. Flag, yes. In in that role only. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um. And and only one of the two people were recovered. Yes. Okay. The other remains. I I don't I don't know. Okay. I don't know about the wife. The husband was. But, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. What was that? I mean, what was sort of the impact of that on on you? you it must have been. Well, I don't, some people affect them affected them pretty bad, but I would guess, and and uh, I was just really why that airplane came down, you know, mm -hmm. you know. Well, it was ultimately ruled an accident. Yes, they say it. They say it blew up. How's that? Okay, mm -hmm. but it seems like you don't agree with that, or that you. Well, I have my uh, thoughts on it because that airplane they tried to reenact it, and they said they could never make it an airplane blow up like that again. You mean in terms of where it took place mm -hmm. and the impact it made and, mm -hmm. and the way? Okay. Mm -hmm. So they could never figure yeah. that out. And are you basing that on your experience in the machine shop and understanding? Yeah, how working the on the airplanes and working on fuel tanks and all of that stuff being mm -hmm. being uh, being around it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel comfortable discussing the discrepancies, or is that uh, that's something more more or less to keep to yourself? Okay, mm -hmm. I understand. Okay, and so and that happened in. 97? 97, I think, or 96, 97, something like yeah. that. I forget exactly what And did. And you came back and mm -hmm. went back to work, yes. Went back to work, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you were still on the scene. Um, no, you were still an organizer. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, you became the general chairman. Uh -huh. Did you experience anything else like that before you? No, not. Sherry not. mentioned earlier being at Kennedy, I guess, and there being an experience. I was at Kennedy. I was in New York on 9-11. You were? Yes. Were you sent there or yeah. were you already there? I was already there on arbitration case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you mind talking a little bit about Sure. About that? Uh -huh. So what was the case? I bet you remember. Oh, it was, a case of, it was a case about an individual. He was a, a ticket agent. We got his job back. <laughs> and he, and he said he didn't want it. And that's when news come over, you know. Uh, I knew the arbitrator well, too. And uh, and the other general chairman, I was the board member up there at the time. And they said a plane went into... A board into, member? Uh, for On the arbitration case. Okay, I said it, okay. I said it. And uh, they said a plane hit the one of the Twin Towers. We thought maybe a little plane, you know, got messed up and bounced off of it or something. And then we said, and then we kept it. On, we kept on with the hearing there for a little bit, and then they say, "No, it was a big plane that went in. It's bad, you know." Mm -hmm. So we got up and start watching the TV. We just discontinued the arbitration, and then they said uh, another one hit the tower. We could see the smoke and stuff from where we were. We we didn't realize really the magnitude of it until we start seeing it on our TV. Then they evac evacuated the hotel we was in and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. There was no cell phone service or, or none of that stuff there for a while. Uh, it, did, it was just complete chaos. 
mm-hmm. at the time up in New York. Mm-hmm. And then uh, no, no place to go, you know, when it was up there. And I, I forget why, it, it had to be on a Tuesday this happened, or mo- Monday or Tuesday, I forget what day it exactly happened. But uh, uh, weathered the course up there and you couldn't get out of the city. There were no airplanes flying. On that Friday night, they opened up. Uh, we drove down to LaGuardia Airport, and we was the only vehicle on the road. It was, uh, it was like a ghost town, New York. No, nothing was uh-huh. functioning. Were you ordered to go down there because you were a machinist, or? Uh, we we're down. No, we was trying to get a flight to get back home. Okay. I was trying to know. We, we thought the airport was going to open. Because okay. I was with some of the, um, it was a time during the transition with American Airlines and TWA. Okay. What the case was. And uh, uh, we were together. I knew the guy that uh, was in uh, human resources for TWA. He had mad, matter of fact, he was a guy that tapped me on the shoulder to come to work for TWA. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we got in that, so we finally rented a car on Friday and drove out of there to Columbus, Ohio, and got a plane to St. Louis, then rented another car, and I finally got home. But uh, it, it was, uh, oh my gosh, it was it was a tragic sight. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I was nowhere around. I was up at JFK where, down in Manhattan where that happened. Okay, mm-hmm. okay, all right. Um, and that it happened around the time that TWA was starting its... Oh, yeah, yeah. they, 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 they were having troubles, yeah. yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were general chairman until 98? Or did you start, you started that in 98? Right around that time, I don't okay. know exactly right time. I, I okay. know I retired in 09. I know that one's all over. Okay. So, from as being an insider, mm-hmm. how do you feel that airline work has changed since September 11th? Do you have any? Oh my gosh, yes! Thoughts, it, yeah. oh, oh, tremendously, it's changed. You know, about security. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not like flying like you did before. Mm-hmm. Not none at all. Mm-hmm. None at all. Go to the security. All that. None of that stuff was at airports before. None of it. Mm-hmm. Going to be searched and all that stuff. You just get your ticket and. Gave it to the tip person at the gate and just walked on an airplane, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, everything is uh, so secure around the airports and all that stuff because you just can't have it with the kooks out there today. Yeah, you just can't have it. Do you, have, has has there been changes though, like in the way that planes are made or built or? Well, I don't know since I've been out of it. I don't know if they're built any different. Mm-hmm. I know that like security on the cockpits doors and. All that, that is a big change and stuff like that. Okay. So they can't enter to get in the cockpit and stuff, you know, okay. stuff like that to keep the crew safe. Okay. But otherwise than that, just the tech, new technology they they have uh, building airplanes are definitely different, you know. Mm-hmm. They use uh, uh, different fibers and stuff on the, when they build airplanes and make them lighter so they can be more fuel efficient and stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. They change that. Okay. They made the, out of composites now and much lighter. Okay. Well, you seem to have really enjoyed the work that you did. But yes, I, I did. But I wonder, did you do you have anyone that you consider a mentor that sort of encouraged you and supported you? Oh, Robert Roach Jr. just went to his retirement, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> so t- can you talk a little bit about... Uh, Robert Rich? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I, said, I told Robert, like, so I could tell some stories at your retirement. He said, you know, some things we don't say. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about. Mm-hmm. No. no. When did you first meet Robert? Oh, my gosh. It was way down here at the district here when he started just about. Mm-hmm. I knew he What was his role, actually? I, I don't, I mean, I know that he was. He, he come in here as a uh, trustee to start with. As a trustee, uh-huh. is I mean, that yeah. good or bad? That's it's good. Oh, it's good. Oh, it's yeah, good yeah, just trustee being a trustee, yeah, you have your okay. trustee, you okay. start out. That is about just as when you just get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. That's what I started out down here at the district. I was a trustee. Oh, okay. I didn't know, yeah, I was a trustee down here too. Okay. And uh, Because he's originally out of the New York. Yeah. 
office, but he moved to Kansas City. No, he didn't move here. This here, this is the main office for District oh, 142. Okay. okay. That was in New York is the a, a, a satellite. Okay. Office up there. Okay. Yeah. So he uh, came on as a trustee. Yeah, I knew Robert back when we used to call one another Bob instead of okay. Robert. Okay. <laughs> yes. And uh, I knew him then, and uh, I knew him then. I well, we worked together, you know, as a union. And then he become a, a general chairman, and then Robert become a Grand Lodge rep, special rep, and then a Grand Lodge rep. And I was working with him in the, in the organizing department then at that time, mm -hmm. and he come, then he become a, a general vice president. Robert did, and then went on to be general secretary treasurer. You know, but uh, I knew him all the way up through the ranks. So we were together quite a bit. You know, you come over to the house together when you come to Kansas City. Uh, we was together quite a bit, yes. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else that was a mentor? Oh, yeah, Bob Haynes. We worked together close with him. Mm -hmm. we, we we fussed and fight, you know, and worked together. And and uh, very, very, very uh, dominating union person, you know. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a mentor. Bill O'Driscoll, you know. Some of the, some of the guys, you know, he just... Uh, get to know and, and what they do and how they do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And very good, very good individuals. What, how has being in a union helped you help your family? Oh, the lifestyle I have today. Yeah? And the benefits and everything from a union. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it's just tremendous. and uh, It ain't just about yourself, it's about everybody, you mm -hmm. know. It's about the, the whole group of people, that's why it's union, you know. And you just don't benefit yourself, the other person benefits from it also. Mm -hmm. uh, they get the fair shake too, how's that? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are any of your daughters in a union and what they do? No, they're not. No? No, no. None of my daughters are. Uh, uh, my daughter's uh, a school teacher, one. One of them works at the cafeteria up here at St. Pius. And, uh, the other one works for pest control, uh, but none of them is union, none okay. of them is union at all. Okay. But they know all about union, so that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> they know that's where they got their clothes from. Right, right. Hmm. I got a, a, a call from my brother that his uh, boy is now uh, working his way up through the union. I don't know which union, he just called, but I will find out in November his daughter gets married he wants to talk to her about the union he's following in your footsteps Uncle Bob they said oh that's <laughs> nice that's nice yes um, well is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to mention anybody else any stories you have any moments that were really really important to you gosh I I don't know. I, I think I think they're all important, you know. Mm -hmm. They're little ones add up to be big ones, you know. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, I love being around the people, you know, uh, to answer their questions. I loved going on the, the floor to talk to the people. I wouldn't be the one to just see them at the meetings. I would go on the, in the hangar and put my jeans on, get in the wheel well with them, leading edge or... I'd go to the reservation center and sit next to with someone taking reservation calls and how it works and how they're doing. You know, uh, uh, I think when you got to know the people, uh, they felt more comfortable around you too as you coming in. You know, they say, "Oh, Bob Bax is coming in town." I wanted them to feel comfortable when I did come in town. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think that's the way. Uh, uh, you got to be honest with the people and tell them the way they don't give them no smoke screen. Just tell them if it's not so good, you tell them it's not so good right now. Mm -hmm. You don't try to make it come something out that's not there. You know, I think you just got to be straightforward with them, and uh, uh, I think you got to get a great response out of the people. Mm -hmm. Well, have you ever had to sort of have you ever encountered people, maybe not union members, but who? maybe had a very negative view of the union oh and, yes sure sure yeah. Yeah. oh yeah and I mean do you find that that's more common these days well you know these days union is not brought up so much anymore like it used to it's just, it's just not brought up 
uh, you hear some people when you hear the benefits a union person come, they say, "Boy, I wish I had that." Mm-hmm. I say, you "Should belong to a union," and you know the subject stops them because they think some people think unions is it's a free ride. You know, you don't have to work, and uh, that's not true. That's not what a union's about. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you talk to them, they, they they change the subject. They go, they know they're wrong to start with. You know, because mm-hmm. I like to sit down. I'll have a conversation uh, with any of them. You know, they start with something. My wife says, "You you're not going to bring that." No, I won't bring it up not unless they bring it up to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. Well, I can't think of anything else. Is there anything you've done actually outside of? Your role as a machinist and oh, like gosh, in the community yeah. or oh, any other. Gosh, yes. Thing. So tell me a little bit about that. We didn't oh, talk about that stuff. I've been president of school boards. I've been on uh, coach. I coached for years. Well, that makes sense given your. Given yeah. What did you coach? I coached boys, you name it basketball, football, baseball. I coached into that. The kids uh, had great opportunities to meet. Uh, Ball players on the Kansas City Royals because their kids used to go to different schools and they were the athletic directors at their grade schools and I was at the school that I had where my kids went to and uh, I was on guys on buildings and grounds committees you know for the schools and stuff uh, always involved in something yes mm-hmm. very much so okay so you had time outside of work to oh yes. And uh, was, you, was your wife always a, a stay-at-home wife? Yes. Oh, no. The first 10 years, she worked for 10 years. We was married eight years for our first oh, child come around. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what did she do? Uh, she was a uh, private secretary. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And mm-hmm. then the girls came along. Then the girls come along and she got to quit. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any grandchildren? Yes. She's got uh, eight and one on the way. You have three daughters, and you have will soon have nine grandchildren. Yes. Mm-hmm. So y'all scale down a little bit from your, from yeah, your parents. Yes. And they, but they're like they're all going to have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic! Well, congratulations. Uh, uh, congratulations. Thank you. But what's the age range on the uh, on the grandchildren? The grandchildren. The oldest is a sophomore in college, and the youngest is on the way. Okay. <laughs> wow. Very good. Okay. Well. Um, you know, uh, if there's nothing else. Okay. And I just want to thank you very much for well, thank you for being willing to sit for an interview mm-hmm. today. And um, it, you know, this is a really fun project for me. I always, mm-hmm. like I said earlier, I always love to travel and meet the machinists mm-hmm. and talk to them. So I appreciate you taking time to share your story. Oh, with thank me God! Today. I, I, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.